is Scott Spears, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Scott Spears Now. Today we get ready for probably the most famous golfing tournament outside the Masters here in Ohio, the Memorial Tournament at Mirfield Golf Course. We're going to discuss that tournament with the Dean of Golfing Journalist, Kay Kessler. For many years, Kay was at the Columbus Dispatch, followed the career of Jack Nicholas more than anybody else from the time he started golfing. And Kay will give us his thoughts, his take on what will happen this year at the Memorial Tournament. Will it rain? I bet it will. That's a given. We don't need Kay for that, but we need Kay to handicap the rest of it for us. By the way, we'll also get Kay's opinion on a recent incident that happened to Tiger Woods, which I'm sure you've heard about. You won't want to miss that. Let's get to it. Without any further ado, here's the Dean of Golfing Journalist, Kay Kessler. This is Scott Spears. And the 2013 Memorial Golf Tournament at the Mirfield Village Golf Club will be taking place May 27th through June 2nd. Joining us to preview this as well as other goings on in the golf world is the Dean of Golfing Journalists, Mr. Kay Kessler. Kay, how are you? I'm uh, about three quarters right now, Scott. But, uh... <laughs> We'll see how things work out. Well, I, I'm glad you're uh, with us. Won't be coming to the memorial this year for the first time in a long time. Uh, maybe for the first time since they started it. This is the number 37, and I think I've made most of them, if I'm not all. But j just a little injury sidelines you, but you're bound to be back soon. Well, hopefully uh, within a month, yeah. I've been down... Down yeah, I want to talk about uh, the memorial coming up here next week, uh, just a few days actually. Uh, in your opinion, who's the odds-on favorite to to do well this year? Oh, you mean as, as far as playing the tournament itself? Yes. Oh, I suppose everybody would say Tiger. He's kind of a little on a hot streak and playing very well. But what's interesting to me today is is that every every tournament, somebody comes out of the ether that you hadn't heard of and has a hot hand. And while Tiger's in the, running every every tournament, somebody else that you've never given much consideration to is hot, and then you don't hear from him again for three or four or five okay. or six as tournaments. As far as the tournament goes, Tiger definitely the odds-on favorite. Is there a guy, I know there are a lot of those guys who could be considered the underdog. If you had to pick one to keep your eye on who maybe isn't favored, who would it be? Oh my, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hot one. I uh, I don't think it's Sergio, although he's in the news right now for reasons that shouldn't be going on and not particularly all his fault. Uh, there's just a bunch of them, and I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't know that I would pick any one guy. I would say McElroy, but uh, lately he missed a cut last week, and, uh, you know, it's a hard guy to hang your hat on. You know, Kay, you've been at this particular tournament, and we had the chance last night to talk a little bit about it. What has made this tournament a success, the Memorial? Well, right off the bat, Jack, uh, Nicholas has made it a success. Uh, he built the course. Uh, he patterned it after uh, Muirfield in Scotland, and uh, that was his dream. Uh, he's done what Augusta has done, uh, in, almost in the footsteps of Augusta, but he wouldn't admit to that. The course is probably as good a shape as any course in the country, maybe better than any outside of Augusta, and it's probably equal to Augusta. I think the shape of the course, the tournament itself, uh, Jack himself, everybody wanting to be part of that. I think it's the course and, and Nicholas that have made it what it is, just as I think it was Augusta National that made Master such a course. We have a different venue every year for for the U.S. Open. We have a different venue every year for the PGA. And we have a different venue every year for the uh, for the British. So, uh, except for Mirville Village and the TPC, they've done, had a couple of different courses, but they're anchored right now the Tour Championship. Uh, I think it's Nicholas in the course that makes it that way. Jack Nicholas, certainly uh, one of our favorites here in Ohio, a hometown boy, but you became known in your days as a golf journalist, which you st I still consider you. Uh, I think many. I still do. dabble in, yes, Scott. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but you were the go to guy for Jack Nicholas. How did that happen? Well, it's not a coincidence, really. I was a sports writer. Charlie hurt his ankle. I was walking around the golf course, with, and Jack was walking with him. Uh, just to keep him company. And Jack Grout, the New Year's first year pro at 
So I was told the two of them. He said, Mr. Charlie, he says, you ought to put your little boy in my junior class. We're going to have a class uh, starting this uh, spring for a bunch of young youngsters. And he says, you ought to put him in there. So he did that. And that was at age 10 in 1950. And Grat had just come on the scene from Hershey, Pennsylvania. And we have done a story about the new pro at South. And so later on, when he had his class, he called me and he said, okay, uh, he says, we're we got this class. Maybe you'd like to come out and take a picture of the youngsters we've got here. We've got 25 or 30 of them. So I went out with a photographer, and we shot this shot of you know, 30 kids out there. And Jackie happened to be one of them, and he, he didn't stick out, and I didn't know he was. I didn't try to identify any of the 30 kids. About a month later, a crowd calls back, and he says, "You know that picture you took of the kids a month or so ago?" He said, "We had our first tournament, and a kid in there, Jackie Boy Nicholas, shot a 51 on the." back front nine of South Country Club uh, in our first tournament as a winner. I says, you're kidding me. 51 at 10 years old, I'm giving up the game. <laughs> well, from that point on, his star just continued to rise. I mean, he said, entered all the junior tournaments that came along in the area in Franklin County and then pretty soon in the state and from 10, 11, 12. By the time he's 13, he's playing in the 15-year-old age. 16 years old, he won the Ohio, Ohio Open and uh, in between rounds of the high open, he went up to a band of mine, played an exhibition with Sam Sneed, and that was his introduction to Sneed. Sneed is a, a legend, well, obviously, as everybody knows. Years later, he didn't have much of a recollection of that meeting. He did beat Jack Kerbanic Country Club 68 to 71, but he didn't particularly know it. Sam didn't know many people other than Hogan and himself and Mangrum and guys like that, but uh, that was their first meeting and from 16 years old on, Nicholas was hot dog. He uh, played in his first U.S. Open at 17. At, uh, and of course, you know what happened after that. It was just magnificent. He won two uh, U.S. Amateurs. And, and then his first uh, major victory, first victory, as a matter of fact, as professional, was in the uh, 1962 Open at uh, Oakmont when he beat Palmer. And the rest is pretty brilliant history. And, the beauty about it, that, uh, that Scott, is that through the years, Jack's now 72, and for all those years from 10 to 72, he has just been an exemplary citizen. He's just done everything possible to enhance the game, not his image. So, Kay, when we look back on the game of golf, uh, certainly Jack has, has not enhanced his image through uh, his own self, as you say, his golf game. When we look at the names like Palmer and, and uh, Rodriguez and Tiger Woods and Nicholas, who's the greatest, in your opinion? Well, I think Jack is. I think from all standpoints, Scott, uh, Jack just stands above. Uh, Tiger's closing in, in a sense, although he's not making much progress lately, he may begin to again on, on Jack's all-time record of late team majors and so forth. But uh, that may happen. Uh, I don't deny Tiger's playing ability uh, as a personality. Uh, there's no comparison. And uh, uh, Jack has just been a, a true gentleman and, a, and an absolute uh, icon for the game of golf, not for Jack Nicklaus, but for the game of golf. He said it a hundred times, uh, even before he went into retirement. The best interview in golf has always been, and probably will continue to be, Jack Nicholas, as long as he'll be willing to sit in front of a microphone and talk to players or talk to the media. I think a lot of people share your opinion on that. Kay, before I let you get out of here uh, on this uh, Memorial Day weekend, I do want to bring up uh, something we alluded to earlier on in the interview, the situation with Tiger and uh, Sergio Garcia. And I want to uh, update the people. If they don't know the story, here's the story in a nutshell. Uh, during a Q&A session, Sergio Garcia was asked if he would invite Tiger Woods to dinner one night during the U.S. Open to settle their differences, Garcia said, and this is the quote, we will have him round every night. We will serve him fried chicken. Okay. Uh, uh, immediately, this caused an uproar. Sergio did apologize, but then the Europe European Tour 
chief executive, Giorgio Grady, responded after Sergio apologized to the question of if they were going to kick Sergio off the uh, open in, in this particular point, and this was his quote, most of Sergio's friends happen to be colored athletes in the United States. He is absolutely abject in his apology, and we accept it. Of course, uproar came for using the word colored in that quote. O'Grady has apologized now, and Tiger took to Twitter uh, and said, the comment made wasn't silly. It was wrong, hurtful, and clearly inappropriate. Uh, Kay, what do you think of this? Well, I like the way you started that, in a nutshell. The whole thing to me is a nutshell. I don't think it should have been blown up like it did. I think that everybody took the opportunity to do it that way. I think this was the before the tournament at Wentworth where, where uh, Sergio is playing and Tiger isn't. And George O'Grady is a, quite a gentleman himself. Uh, Peter Dawson of the, U, U, of the RNA did not take exception to it. I think Tim Finchin tried to handle as well as he could, but I think we, and I include myself of the media, fanned the fire there. I don't think it should have been. Uh, they even harkened back to the, way, the days when they got Fuzzy Zeller making his comments, and I don't think that should have been res resurrected. And I think it was an innocent thing that burned uh, Tiger, uh, burned uh, Sergio, I should say, severely. And Sergio's been a a crusty little fellow and hard to handle sometimes in the past. I don't think Tiger's been the easiest in the world. In fact, he's been in one of the most difficult interviews in, in golf history. Uh, if he's doing great, he's wonderful. If the magic eye of the camera's on him, he's great. But generally, he is very, very close to knit, uh, just within himself, and he does not carry on a good interview. And so these people, and myself included, are the people who fanned the fire on this thing that I don't think was there. They made a heck of a lot more out of it than was really there. And yes, it became a racial thing, and that's a shame. And it became a racial thing that almost ruined Fuzzy's career. I mean, he, Fuzzy was sick on that for so long, it was unbelievable. And uh, I just think it's a very silly thing to have carried on. Everybody has certain differences out there, and, and to say most of Sergio's friends were African-American or colored, uh, however you want to phrase it, isn't exactly right, although he does have a lot of pals from Europe and South America and so forth, but that's the way it is. And I just think it was way, way, way overblown, Scott. That's o Overblown more because it was a nothing story or overblown because of the term he used. Because... Uh, the no, thing I think it was overblown, Scott, because of it was Tiger. Uh, I really do. Uh, and yeah, the term wasn't good. Uh, we have to be very careful with our language. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I just think it, 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 Tiger didn't help it come to a head. He just, I think he kept it going. And I know so Sergio makes stupid comments a lot of times, and that, that happened to be one. But I just think that we, a lot of the writers, uh, media, thought, oh, hot dog, this is something that's really going to get us going, that things are maybe a little dull, and let's keep this going. Because anytime you got Tiger in the news, everybody loves it. Uh, I mean, there's no question about it. He's the number one guy right at the moment. Uh, if a tournament doesn't have Tiger, they're upset. The fans are upset. Uh, so, uh, but they just made more of it than was there. That's my own opinion. Uh, uh, Kay, the interesting thing here, would it have been a story if Sergio and Tiger didn't have this known feud? I don't think it would have been, no. Do you think it would have been a story if uh, Tiger had said that to Ernie Els or to uh, Bubba Watson or gosh knows who, or if he just said it, he just said it to uh, Chichi Rodriguez years ago, uh, for example. I know that years ago, and this is also not too widely known, but Chichi at Augusta was asked to leave the tournament. Because, I mean, his wife was asked to leave the tournament because her hair was too long. She was a gorgeous woman, and she wore a kind of a backless dress at the tournament, and it, it, it was quite low. And uh, she was asked to leave the tournament, and there was not much made of that. But Lee, at Lee Trevino, who had befriended uh, Chichi, Lee got furious about it. Well, Lee never mentioned this as one of the reasons that he had trouble at Augusta, but Lee also did not play Augusta much, and he didn't care to. And that 
in the root of it, that was part of the issue that never ever came out too too widely in the media. Okay, if I don't think Scott, I don't, I don't think there's anybody today that's ever made reference to that particular flare up. I think you're right. I think definitely the fact that it was Tiger Woods certainly got it on the front page of some oh, sports sure. papers. Absolutely. But but the question I can't figure out that when I when I run this through in my head, if if that question had been asked of Sergio about, for instance, say Jack Nicholas, would he have said fried chicken? Because that's the the key term. That's the trigger. But I mean, <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. That's a tough one. Uh, because it, fried chicken certainly is a, a popular dish on, on American diets. Uh, he could have said uh, T-bone steak. He could have said pork loin. He could have said uh, bison burgers or anything like that. It happened to be fried chicken. Uh, yeah, maybe it was a pointed comment because of Tiger. Yes, they have had little differences. Uh, but I'll tell you, I do know this, that despite the general impression that Tiger is befriended by so many people on the tour, and you hear about Steve Stricker's friendliness and John Cook's and uh, and Mark O'Meara's, and everybody says that that's, Tiger's a great friend and so forth. I don't think the general uh, feeling among the tour is quite as uh, sweet and uh, honey as, as uh, everybody's trying to make it, and I'm glad they make it that way because I don't see any reason to stir this up. Let them do their arguing and so forth on, on the golf course. I think you're right, and I think that's what eventually will happen. I certainly don't think Sergio is going to lose his position because of this, which some people certainly called for. But I guess what it comes back to is, uh, we talked about it there, the definite word of it, because fried chicken has always been a little pointed when it comes to uh, African-American heritage. Uh, well, if he had said T-bone steak, it wouldn't have been a story, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, that's true. What if he said watermelon or something like that? Then that yeah, there you go. I mean, he just, it was an offhanded mark. And yes, maybe it was pointed. You don't know what's in the back of Sergio's mind. He does say some silly things once in a while. But on the whole, I think Sergio has a surly appearance about him that's kind of mis misdirected. I, uh, he does have a charming smile when he wants to, but just normally he goes along with his mouth closed and kind of puffed out. And he's got a surly look about him. So, but I, I just think that, that, that we made a heck of a lot more of it than the radio says there and it's not going to die down because we we've, we've got it going and i know that a lot of the talk show posts i'll talk about all the twitters they get 110 million hits on this every day well that's what they like they want hits on something like that so it's provoked believe me it's provoked Kay, do you think any of this has to do, uh, I just make light of this because Bob Costas on Piers Morgan uh, the other night, a week ago or so, I don't know if you saw that program, talked about, uh, yeah, Bob Costas said that uh, he was kind of, uh, I don't want to, I, I don't have the quote so I can't say it, but that he was um, of the opinion that for so many years it was hard to believe that the people doing the Masters on CBS never talked about Augusta's history as far as not admitting a black member until 1990, not admitting women until last year. They weren't allowed to talk about it, and he would never have felt comfortable doing the Masters because he would have had to have talked about that. Well, that's, I know Costas quite well, and uh, certainly that's an opinion. I don't quite share it. Uh, they are a total private entity, Augusta National is. Uh, they are not run by committee. They are run by a chairman in this particular case, Billy Payne, who is the sixth and fifth or sixth. I think he's the sixth chairman in the history of the tournament, in the history of the golf course. And yes, they're, they're pretty set in their ways, uh, and, and uh, they are very private. They just got around this year to uh, bringing in a woman with Condoleezza Rice and the other lady. And uh, it was a long time coming until they had another Africa, our first African-American male member. Uh, there are other members. Women have played there before. African-Americans have played there before. They, any of them ever had memberships. They just make it a private affair, and that's their business and nobody else's. And uh, if Bob doesn't like it and doesn't want to talk about it or is afraid to talk about it or doesn't care to talk about it because he thought it should be brought out in the open, well, certainly he's entitled to that opinion. I don't think it's an issue now, particularly that it's wide open. Uh, years ago, uh, uh, his name escapes me right now, but the, 
uh, in uh, Alabama. They had a marvelous golf course down there, and they were not allowed to have a PGA tournament because they didn't have a, a um, an African American member. Well, eventually they caved in, and uh, they had a member, and so that went by the books. Uh, I, I think I think Bob's point in general was that. Uh, you are not allowed as a CBS broadcaster to say anything. It's not whether you believe or don't believe. It's not happenstance. It's that they will pull you off. The club yeah, will come after you. Well, this goes back to, uh, to Gary McCord's comments before and Jack Whitaker's. Um, they weren't off-color comments. They were, color, they were comments about uh, uh, like uh, body wax on the greens, uh, uh, which they took exception to and banned uh, it banned the cord, and uh, Whitaker said something about dyeing the ponds a uh, uh, different color than the mud because they'd had a flood, and then the Race Creek uh, got muddy, and then so they, he talked about dyeing them. And then they talked about mobs coming up 18 green, and then, of course, in their uh, majestic manner, uh, Augusta said, we don't have mobs <laughs> at Augusta. Well, that's kind of petty, I agree. And I see where Bob got his nose out of shape on that and, and is taking a stand. Well, good for him. I think that's fine. Uh, it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me that uh, Augusta did what it did. Uh, next thing I know, Augusta could say, I, I'm not welcome there because of something I forgot I said and did. That could happen. I've been to 50 of them so far. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, as a journalist, Kay, this is what I find interesting, because the argument always is, the argument that you gave, is that they are a totally private entity, so they should be allowed to do what they want to do. But if you are broadcasting there, uh, the truth is they didn't have a black member until 1990, and the truth is they ha didn't have a woman until last year. Correct. So if that is public knowledge, and they're okay with it being a private club, why would they drop the bomb on you and tell you not to talk about it, or at least have it be in the ether not to talk about it if you're there? Well, basically because they want everything to be as pro near perfect as they can possibly get it. They don't like anything untoward about their tournament being aired. Uh, I have no problem with that, as I say. The PGA Tour controls everything else, uh, with the exception of the U.S. Open and the Masters. Uh, on, it, on their tournaments, and they run those the way they care to do. And uh, but this, these two tournaments are the only ones that was, are run by a one separate entity. Let me ask you this, Kay. I, I know what your feeling is on it. You gave us your opinion there, but uh, when you were going strong at the Columbus Dispatch, if you had Six written, German, go ahead, Scott. No, no, I, I, I don't want to. Uh, yes, I, yes, I, I don't no, want to. No, that's that. No, no, no problem. Yeah, if you would have written a column in 1985 saying that they had never admitted a black member and that they didn't have women there, would you have been welcome? I might have. I don't know that I have to look back in my records, but I may have said some reference to the fact that they don't have a black African-American member or that they don't have a female member. I do know that so many of those same people that aren't members did and they have indeed played there. I know a number of the LPGA women who have played there. I know a number of women who even are LPGA members who have played there. I know black people who have played there before blacks were members. And I may have made some reference myself. I don't know. Uh, the fact that I was probably with the Columbus Citizen Journal and it was kind of a little blip on their radar, uh, they may not have ever seen it. You know what I'm saying? No, this, I... was a, this is a national TV thing that was brought to stir because of what happened with the, um, the one we're talking about most recently was happened over at Wentworth, England. And it immediately got news and bingo, everybody heard it. And the same thing is true with what uh, McCord said. His was on... Uh, national Network uh, went all over, and Jack Whitaker's comments uh, likewise did the same thing. Did I don't know. You might take David Ferry, who I happen to love him immensely for his spontaneity and his humor, but somewhere along the line with some of his, his pranky jokes, uh, Augusta might get little wrinkled shorts over that, but I doubt it. Uh, I think they're uh, getting a little more open-minded, let's put it like that. 
As a human being, Kay, all the years that you've covered golf, still doing it uh, obviously very well, um, knowing that this has gone on at Augusta and that women have played there and, and African Americans have played there, do you understand as a human being why it's a private club and they can say what they want, but why don't they admit? Didn't they, did they have a rule against African Americans? Did they have? I don't a rule know that they had a rule against it, Scott. They just never had it come up apparently until we started rubbing it, rubbing their noses in it. I mean, back back when Bobby Jones and Cliff Roberts started this thing in the late early thirties, the first tournament being thirty four. Uh, I don't know that that was an issue, you know. Uh, uh, blacks at the time, Amer African Americans, uh, obviously were still having a horrible time. And look at what happened with baseball and Jackie Robinson in 1942 and so forth. These things happened later. Uh, at that time, it wasn't it wasn't an issue. Uh, there were no African American on the tour playing to speak of. Ted Rhodes came along among the first ones. Uh, you know, it's uh, the elder. Uh, finally made it, and uh, uh, yeah, they had feelings about it, but I don't remember Lee Elder being particularly bitter about it. Uh, a couple of the others were, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't an issue. And now all of a sudden, when when uh, the door opens, uh, all of a sudden here the Augusta is has a closed door. Everybody else has opened theirs, and Augusta's closed theirs, and it took them forever to open it. And, and, and so the longer it went the more of an issue people made of it. Something you said earlier on, Kay, was, was very interesting and I'm sure caught the viewer's uh, ear. Um, if nobody knows anything about golf right now, they know the name Tiger Woods. He has become sure. the face of golf. Your feelings seem to be that he possibly is not the nicest person in the world. Why does he have that stance in the golf world, besides being a great player? Because we've had those before, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, a lot of them. But, but Tiger has sort of transcended that in a, in a strange way. Well, I, I must admit, um, my opinion uh, of Tiger is somewhat uh, tainted from my first experience. Uh, when he was a boy wonder, as you know, back when he was two, he was on television. And when he was five, his dad said, someday he's going to be president. Earl said those things. And he became an issue. Uh, and then suddenly he came on the scene and he, he won an NCAA championship. And then he won his last one in Memphis. And I'm thinking it was 1996 or seven. And by any rate, when he won it in Memphis on Saturday, he was flown to um, Columbus to receive the Jack Nicklaus Trophy as the golfer of college golfer of the year on Sunday at noon when Jack at that same particular time was announcing the honoree for the next tournament, but it, he took the time in front of all the media in a presentation to have Tiger there and welcome Tiger as uh, the champion uh, for his great prowess in the collegiate field and winning the NCAA again that day before. And we're so proud to have you here, and we look forward to the day, Tiger, when you will come and perhaps play in our tournament, which he's now won five times. And, and Jack was very nice and made a nice presentation, had his coat and tie on. And, and Tiger sat in the chair with his red shirt from Saturday still on, which I'm not taking offense to, but he didn't rise. He kind of said a very muffled, uh, thank you, Jack. And somebody in the audience, that's all he said to Jack. And somebody in the audience said, Tiger, how about a couple of questions? And Tiger says, no, no questions. He says, I, I got to get my get on the plane and get back to Stanford and get back to school. I thought that was one of the most disrespectful moments I'd ever seen. And that was Tiger's at that time, 17 or 18 or whatever it was. And I thought that right there turned me against Tiger. And but the point is, he has been no, he has not had a public image that has improved one bit since then. I mean, yes, he smiles and it flashes that smile at certain moments. As a general rule, if he isn't playing, performing well, and he comes off the golf course, signs his scorecard, go, and goes into the tent, comes back out, and the kids are screaming at the ropes trying to get his autograph. If he didn't play well or had a good time or was mad about something, boy, he was dead straight ahead and shunned them all, just 
kept right on going, never did it. And another time I saw him do this, and he's, he's complimented for the way he signs them, when he signs them. This particular time, he signed him, and then he signed the kid's cap and threw it over his shoulder instead of handing the kid back and threw his scorecard and did the same thing. And I thought, this just isn't the way you do it. Nicholas will stand, Arnold will stand, Watson will stand, and Phil Mickelson today will sign until their feet are wearing out, so they don't have any more pins and so forth. But not Tiger. So uh, yes, he's a, he's a different personality. He's a great golfer, but his uh, public persona to me is. Uh, Pretty well discolored, to use the wrong expression. Uh, aside from being a great golfer, why is he the face of golf now? Well, I mean, he came on so strongly, and, and he certainly is a hero to African-American kids who never thought much of golf at all, and suddenly this guy is absolutely magnificent. He's a, first of all, he's a great physical specimen. He's probably one of the best conditioned players out there, uh, and that includes P.J. Singh. And I think that they all of a sudden had a great, it's like Jackie Robinson in a sense. And uh, Tiger was the, was the first one. I'm sure you had Lee Elder and Ted Rose and some, uh, several others that were quite good. But when he came and dominated the way he did and he got to people, he, he got to people who just never played golf. And I think that was a real stimulus in itself. And of course, TV thrives on that. And I, I don't blame him, it's, certainly you do that. But I think that's the big issue right there. He was the first really brilliant hero for them, and away we go. And yes, he helped golf immensely in that in that regard. He did not do it as a personality. He did as a performer, a player on the golf course. And again, that goes back to the Sergio Tiger thing. Let's do these things on the golf course. You know, two years ago, Kay, I, I saw an article, and I, I can't remember it word for word, obviously. It's been a while. But basically, the summation of it was Tiger makes very little money from golf. It's made from endorsements. For a guy who, <laughs> who you say uh, does not have a very personable attitude, why do so many companies want this guy? Oh, my heavens, because it's just what I said a moment ago, he's, a, he's a, you said it too, he's the face of golf now. Uh, he, yes, you said he didn't make a lot of money in golf. He still makes more than anybody else. One percent of his income, I think. There was a day his, his, his uh, caddy, Stevie Williams, who now is caddy for uh, Bubba, uh, made more money. He was the second leading money winner on the tour after Tiger. Since Caddy got so much from, from Tiger's playing, Tiger makes a ton on the tour. Yes, he makes a ton. He has lost, and you may take a look at this, he has lost more sponsorships than most guys have. That's how many the guy had originally. But he's lost a ton of sponsorships over some of his recent uh, off, off golf course performances. So he's getting them back now because suddenly he's performing again. It, no, no, uh, Nike, Lord, yes, they're going for him. The Rolex or whatever they may be, uh, yeah, they're going to pay him because people still fall over Tiger. Kay, what are you doing these days? Uh, well, still writing, I know. What, what, what? I'm still just mostly doing uh, freelance things for a magazine occasionally and uh, keeping my fingers in it. And I still go to the Masters every year and the Memorial and the U.S. Open and so forth. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to be as active as I can. Uh, golf has been great. Sports writing has been my life. Uh, so many guys have said the same thing, that never had to work a day in their lives because they were a sports writer that um, had a little bit of success. So I've loved it. It's been a, it's been a tremendous uh, it's been a tremendous life, and I wouldn't trade it or give it up. Any regrets? Not a one. Uh, yeah, I have a regret that I got in a fight with a shovel and a tree root last month but no no regrets i, I love and i love golf i did everything before golf i once the paper folded in 85 in columbus i came out here with the international golf tournament as the media director and the player relations director and, and i did a lot of procuring of the foreign players for the international tournament i as a matter of fact got sergio for the first tournament ernie ells uh jose mario Otavo, and so forth and i'm proud of all that I had a lot of fun doing it, and uh, then our international tournament collapsed after 20, 21 events, and uh, I've just been doing freelance writing since then and uh, doing a lot of traveling. It's gotten a lot of Good. Good to hear. So as we head into the memorial this upcoming week, uh, Tiger, definitely odds-on favorite, as you oh, said. 
and and, and and maybe uh, maybe Mickelson an underdog. Oh, I think Mickelson is probably more of an underdog than he has been coming into most tournaments because he's not performing well. I think McElroy will pull himself together. Bubba Watson, you haven't heard a whole lot since Masters a year ago. You know, um, these guys just show up all of a sudden and bingo, and they're they're hot. And I think that's could happen. Uh, Kenny Perry, who never had a you know a glittering career, just a wonderfully good career. He's won this thing three times. Tiger's won it five. Uh, if you win a tournament five times, he's won Arnold's tournament seven times. When Arnold has his tournament next year, who do you think is going to be favored? Pick anybody you want, but the odds on favorite is going to be Tiger. I mean, he, they, those are two courses that he happens to like. It has nothing to do with, and I'll have this to say too, and Tiger, uh, both Jack and Arnold have been very circumspect and very careful with all of their comments when Tiger was going through his off off golf course capers and they've been very very kind to him and uh, that certainly has helped him sustain himself through it all so uh, I'll give them credit for being gentlemen in that regard but you aren't going to find two greater guys in the game than Arnold and Jack and Tom Watson belongs with them and so forth so sometimes Arnold gets an interesting rap I think uh, sometimes people say some interesting stuff about him Oh, there's hard, hard to knock him, though. I mean, Arnold is wonderful. He, uh, I mean, man, this guy's 82 years old, and he, he's still out there trying to perform. Jack doesn't want to get on the golf course anymore except for some favors. But Arnold is wonderful. He, he does a great interview and doesn't say a whole lot when you get an interview done with uh, Arnold. Everybody's had a great time and a bunch of laughs. And then you look at your notes, and one guy says to the other guy, what'd you get? And he says, I didn't get much. He says, boy, was he fun, though. And that, that's Arnold. Watson is a much like Nicholas. He, he says an awful lot of things that you can file and make a column out of month, a week later when you're kind of hard up looking for something. Comments from Jack at Augusta this year, and the man isn't even playing those stupid things. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the guy is popular, but I mean, uh, uh, and we don't have those kind of icons, I don't think. Anymore. Tom Watson is still outperforming, but uh, Phil, I think, will be, but Phil's an interesting guy. He's got other things, other priorities. His wife and his kids uh, and his mother with their illnesses are his priorities. Uh, Bubba Watson, some of his funny cars may be their priorities. Tiger's priority is winning and beating everybody to death, and I think that's great. He's focused. Nicholas was focused, and Sil was, was a true gentleman all the way. Hey, okay, I think somebody... Uh watching this interview might say that you have a little bit of a bone to pick with tiger it, it sounds I very I won't and I, I will tell you right up front i've said that to start with i i'm disappointed in his performances everywhere except on the golf course and i think on the golf course he is remarkable and i and i wouldn't doubt that he he's 37 he pulls himself together and he can still win you know nicholas a lot of things are forgotten he's won his 18 majors He's been 19 second times in majors. He's got 19 second places in majors. He's got 49 second places on the tour, 49 second places. So for all of his victories, he's always been a performer. Well, Tiger's pretty much like that. You don't see Tiger far, finish far down in the field in any, in any tournament he enters. But that's because he does not want him to, he will not put on a bad performance. Nicholas can turn, a 78 into a 72 because he just perseveres. He will not perform bad. Tiger has that ability too. I'll, I'll give Tiger credit. I just think his off, off course, off his course performances are a little bit uh, tainted and uh, not very admirable in my book. I don't mind saying it either. No, no, I, I think you're entitled to your opinion and I, I certainly appreciate you giving them. But let me phrase it like this just to go back one more time on, on this whole shot. on this whole Sergio thing. Uh, uh, being that we say your opinion on Tiger, you say he's a great draffer, obviously, oh, but his yeah. but his off course behavior has soured him has soured you on him a bit. Doesn't the off-course behavior of Sergio possibly sour him to people who think that that fried chicken remark was a racial epitaph? I mean, it well, happened. I think so. I agree. I'll give you that one, Scott. Sure, but but I don't think Tiger or Sergio's off-course behavior 
Phil Mickelson's off course behavior or anybody else's has quite come up to what, what Tigers has been. So the, therefore, yes, what Sergio said certainly doesn't do him any honors, do, give him any credit. No, absolutely not. L let me say this then. Uh, uh, what's the best shot you've ever seen? We're, we'll get into that, Kay. What's the best shot? Best, what? best shot you've ever seen on the golf course? Oh boy, it's hard to say. Maybe Jack's tee shot at uh, 17 at uh, at uh, Pebble Beach. Uh, Tom Watson's second shot out of the muff into the cup at Pebble Beach that took the that took a another U.S. Open away from Jack. Those are two pretty remarkable shots. Tiger hit a putt on the 17th green at the, at the Players a couple of years ago that took a route that went something like around the world because he played it so well and made a birdie on that that was unbelievable. I think those are Bubba's, walk, Bubba's shot out of the, out of the nowhere, uh, out of the forest primeval at the Augusta a year ago to, to win that one and beat least Haven was remarkable. That might have been the craziest shot in the world, but it's a shot that Bubba could perform and maybe only Phil Mickelson too could have done it. Those are, those, those are the shots I remember, yeah. David Graham hit one at Marion when he hit from the 17th at Marion years ago. I saw that one. And uh, that's the same place that Hogan did it and I didn't see that one at Hogan's. But I did see Hogan's last uh, at Masters when he shot on Saturday, 30 on the back nine for a, a remarkable 66, and that was his last hurrah, his last tournament ever at Augusta. So those are some uh, some of the more remarkable. I think that performance by Hogan on Saturday on his last tournament in the late 60s was one of the most chilling, thrilling Masters I saw. And of course, Jack did something similar in 86. When he won his 18th and last major. Kay, Kay, the final question I'm going to ask you, I want you to think about for a minute, is is uh, how would you like to be remembered years from now when people look back on you? Because as I introduced you, it was the dean of golf journalists, and I think most well, people would. I think you, may have, you may have gone a little overboard. No, there. no, I, I think that's right. Now, I want you to answer that in a second, but I want to go back and say two things first. Number one, uh, on on the memorial tournament, because that's the important thing. Uh, you don't have to be a weather person to know it's going to rain, right, Kay? Not at Memorial, uh, even Barbara's got that now. She still goes up to the Indian and in the grounds and says her prayers. <laughs> and the other th yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, that's, that's part of it. No, a uh, friend of mine, Panel Savage, my best buddy, uh, who was the chairman of that tournament for years, always used to say, oh, we're going to have good weather. I, I've been studying. I says, Pandal, you and I both lived here all our lives. And we know no matter when they change the date of the memorial, they're going to have some kind of funny weather. Well, we had the same thing out here with the international. You start trying to predict weather in golf, and you're, you're, you might as well go to Las Vegas and lose it. <laughs> so. And the other question before we get to how you want to be remembered, Kate, just because we have talked about the Tiger uh, Sergio thing, and I, I do like your frank answers, and it was really strange to me, honestly, this is the first time a golf story got that kind of attention. I saw yeah. him talking about it on The View. I mean, it was quite amazing how far this, this golf story got, but... I guess the, the final question to you would be, I'm sure you, you have African-American friends. I'm sure you have friends of all uh, races. I did and a eulogy and I wrote the uh, church program for Kenny Sheriff, ah. a great friend of mine from Worthington, who was out here at Colorado at the time. And yes, he was. I went to school with some very great friends, and I still have today great friends who are African-American. So the question would be, if... If somebody asked you about them, because this was all third party, this was a reporter talking to Sergio about Tiger. If somebody asked you about them, would you say the word fried chicken? Would you think that's just a, a dinner dish, or is that just too racially charged when it comes to that? Well, I, this is not really fair, Scott, because I wasn't there. I think sometimes it's in the delivery and it's in the, the appearance and it's the moment. If I'd have been there and seen it, and maybe I, maybe you would immediately, you know, contact, uh, take that as a racial comment. Uh, on the other hand, if you weren't there, you don't exactly know how it came out. So I, I don't know. I don't think I would have. Uh, and that's suddenly they all brought this poor, poor, fuzzy thing up because of that, which also continued to fan the fire. And I think anything they can do today 
to keep it alive and keep the public sending in their replies, you know, the twits and the tweeters and so <laughs> forth. That's what they want to do. And I don't think they much care how they go about doing it. I mean, that's, I've got Woody Page and some of these guys in cold, cold bananas or cold pizza or whatever their program is. And they I try to outshout each other and so forth. And they feed on this sort of thing. And the public loves it. So, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not faulting it. I'm just saying that I think it's a darn shame. I think you're right. I think it's been nice that we've had a discussion and not a shouting match about it. But, but you know, the interesting thing, and we didn't talk about it much, and I don't want to take too much time to say it, but would you ever refer, and this is, sir, I want to make this clear, Sergio did not say this, uh, Mr. Yeah. O'Grady said this, but would you ever refer in 2013 uh, to African Americans as colored people, as he did in his remark? I don't want to say I wouldn't, uh, Scott, I'm not real sure. Uh, you know, that was a, even when I, when I grew up in Worthington with, with colored families, Negro families, America, they weren't called African Americans back then. You know, they were called Negroes, and now they don't want, they aren't called Negroes. So whether I would say it today, I don't know. I mean, in an offhand, you, you get somebody in an off, off moment, and they don't stop and think. Well, that's what I think Tiger, or what I think Sergio did, he didn't stop and think. And he was, I'm a big stupid, it's sort of like what David Chenzo said when he signed it wrong for the wrong scorecard and lost to, or lost the opportunity to win the Masters when Bob Colby won. And he says, I'm a big stupid. Well, I think Sergio was a big stupid. And I'm not going to say I wouldn't say color today. I guess I'm kind of careful in the way my words because everybody is so sensitive. And I think we say now, because it's become custom, we say African Americans. Right. I, I just, and uh, uh, you've met Mr. O'Grady, say he's a nice gentleman. I like George very much. Yeah. I, I just, I, I think he realized, because he did apologize, I think he realized that he probably shouldn't have used that word. He, he hit the wrong pedal. That's yeah. That's exactly right. And, and, and this is true. He knew it was going to come back and bite him. Yeah. George, George uh, tried to recover and it didn't happen, you know. And uh, Peter Dawson of the RNA, I don't know what he said, but he didn't he didn't get him he didn't get his shorts wrinkled over that. So <laughs> <laughs> now, it's interesting. It, being a media savvy guy, obviously, Kay, what do you make to Tiger taking to uh, Twitter after that, and and really not letting him off the hook? Uh, yeah, he wanted a fan. That's yeah. He did he did the same thing that we in the media, and I say we, and I don't agree with it, but. He did what the media did. He kept it going. You're exactly. And, and Kay, I've enjoyed this conversation because, been frank, and I think more people need to have that conversation well, that we just had rather than the, the screaming and yelling. I've had fun, Scott. That's all. Kay, yeah, how would you like to be remembered before we get out of here? I do want to get that in. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you. I, uh, years ago, I covered all 28 years of Woody Hayes at Ohio State. And you want somebody controversial. Uh, I had to love it. He and I went belly to belly on a couple of occasions once at the Rose Bowl. We always, uh, I just had all 28 years of him and I, I loved it. It was fun. And yeah, maybe we provoked him too as somebody did the, with the Tiger thing. But I remember once at the, one of the last Rose Bowls, some guys were done this Friday and we're waiting on the game. And so Woody's sitting around with all the media in an easy chair pontificating and he, as he does and the hay is in the barn. and. Somebody, Jim Murray, it happened to be, he says, well, Coach, uh, you've been around now for a long time. Who was your, your favorite sports writer? And he, he looked around the room, and he's looking for a gentleman named Paul Horning from the Columbus Dispatch, who uh, sadly is no longer with us. And very nice Captain Casper Milk to a sort of a guy, but a great guy. And he looked around, and he couldn't find him because Paul was standing behind him. And somebody in the audience says, Woody, he's, he's right behind you. And Woody looks around and he says, yeah, he says, Paul Horning. That's, but he looked over in the doorway and I'm standing there with Cy Burek from the Dayton Journal and Aaron and me. And we're standing in the doorway, everybody else sitting down. He looks across the room and he says, but those two guys over there, Cy Burek and Kay Kessler, by God, they've always been fair. That's all I want. Mm. Wood, Wood said, you've always been fair. That's all I want anybody to say. <laughs> I think they'll say it, Kay. And I want a spontaneous answer to this question. And I hope we do get together after the memorial. But if if we get together after the memorial and do an interview, who will we be talking about as the winner? Kay Kessler, the human being's opinion. 
<laughs> you mean you got to pick one, huh? Pick one. Uh, all right, I... Uh... I'm going to pick Rory just for earnest because I think the kid is going to come back someday, and this is a pretty good place to do it. I think the odds are against him. Going with the underdog. Well, I don't think anybody else there is an underdog right now. I don't think anybody's going to not pick Tucker as many times as he's won the thing. And he's on a semi-good roll now. He hasn't had a bad tournament this year, and he's won four times, don't forget. That, that's Nobody else has won four times this year. Well, Kay, as I said, I hope we get together when this is over and, and talk about the fallout and see what happened, and we'll, we'll, we'll I miss hope you. I get back there for the, for the uh, President's Cup in September. Absolutely. We'll, we'll miss you this year. Uh, well, Jack and those going to miss me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that's true. He'll, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kay, it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Scott. Take care. Later. Bye-bye. Kay, certainly always interesting, always fun, always has the great viewpoint of somebody who followed the sport of golf since its inception into the mainstream media. Kay Kessler, what a guy. Before we get out of here, though, on this episode of Scott Spears Now, we need to check in with Mr. Free Money himself in his regular segment on our show, How to Get Free Money. Matthew uh, but now let's talk about health care. You know, there's a new Obamacare out there. If you haven't heard about it, you know, if you're living in a cave somewhere and <laughs> you don't know it's coming, and it's coming like in, you know, what is today, May? So about six months, it's going to be here in full force. But it's already here. People don't realize that. And uh, what we hear on the news about it, people trying to scare the pants off of you, half the people don't like it, uh, things like that. And yeah, I, to me, it's all stupid. It's gonna be here, something's gonna happen. And yeah, I don't like it either, you know, because it deals with the existing system. That's why I, I can't understand these people are so upset because they're changing the healthcare system. No, they're not. It's the same bloody system. You know, the medical people and you know, all the health cares are all going to get money, you know, the same money and more than they had before because the government's not going to pay for it. So, it, I mean, it's stupid, but this is reality. So what you have to know as a consumer is what's available for you. You want to fight the system, that's separate. You know, uh, but, but getting health care is very important. So you have to know what's going on. And really, for the, everybody out there, to tell you the truth, it's a win. But who's losing? Probably the taxpayers, because they're going to cost us more. Yeah. But that, that's another question. What you want to know is get covered health care you know, and how to do it. Well, the important thing is that it goes up to $94,000, and the government will give you money to help you pay for health care. $94,000. That's right. <laughs> and more people will be covered 100% you know, uh, by health care, and that's important. So the subsidy is important, you know, uh, getting you health care is important, and that's what it'll do. You know, so all the other scare stuff, I mean, yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe, you know, there's a better way to do it. I, I certainly think so. But this is reality. More people are going to be covered. Okay, so you got to find out about it. And look at this data. You know, 72% uh, of the people making from zero to $94,000 don't know about their options other than the new insurance plan for Obamacare. They have no idea. That's 72% of the people have no idea what the hell's in this plan. <laughs> so how could you be complaining? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But more importantly, that 72% has to start learning. You've got to know because this is going to come and, and there's other good things about it because you don't have to deal with salesmen anymore. You know? And that's important. So 72% don't know about the plan. But before we get into the salesman part, let me show you another interesting thing about the new program that's in effect now. That's why you don't have to wait till January. Right now, you're covered. If you have any kind of health care plan now, a current plan with anybody, you know, your employee, yourself, Medicare, Medicaid, anything, any plan at all, you're covered, anything, all preventive services are free. Free, free, <laughs> free. So if you want to lose weight, that's a preventive service, see? Because if you're overweight and you want to lose that weight so you don't get sick, right? So that's a preventive care. You can get weight loss programs for free under the 
Obamacare, this so-called Obamacare. Depression, you're suffering depression and want to get treated. That's a, you know, that is available free under the new theology. Smoking, you want to quit smoking, that's available for you. Actually, there's other programs that now that offer it for free in a lot of states too. Alcohol abuse, you know, you, treatment recovery, so any of these kinds of things, any kind of preventive care. You want to go for a physical, a full wellness physical. Hey doc, every week I want to come in and get checked to make sure I can run that triathlon tomorrow. Free. They can't charge a nickel, copay, nothing. You pay, I pay, nobody pay, you know? It has to be covered. So that's, I think, very important. You go in and get a cholesterol check right now. You know, you get uh, any kind of checkup, you know, that you want, any kind of test. All those are free uh, under the new plan. So that's important to know. I mean, your family should know about that. You have to tell anybody. You have seniors or whatever. You know, they they because they don't want to do the copay, even if it's thirty dollars for it. No, they can't do that. So get your butt out there and see somebody and help yourself, help your family and stuff like that. Here under that, and, and you know, because of that, over eighty million people in this country are now eligible but to take advantage of this free. 100% free preventive care. The law requires that current health care plans offer free preventive care even if your plan did not do so earlier. There are no incidental amount of free preventive service, incremental amount of fee, free preventive service. So they can't charge a nickel you know, to do any of those things. Now another thing that's going to happen in, in the Obamacare that you should start uh, getting educated about is these uh, uh, the health care, gosh, what do you call those things? Remember, Smiley? Yeah. What are the health cooperatives? What are the state pro? Exchanges. What? Exchanges. Exchanges, that's it. Why can't I really? Getting old, I forget everything. Uh, uh, health care exchanges. Every state's going to have one. There's a couple states that oh, we're not going to do this. And, uh, well, then, even if they don't, the government's going to have one. And, and, and they, from, they sound great because now it's a place, it's going to be like consumer reports for health care. You go to one place, all the plans are equal, so you won't have some salesman come, hey, you know, all those other plans are full of crap, you know, and you better buy mine or else you'll die. <laughs> That's how salesmen operate, you know. You know, you go to these places, you know, and they have them all categorized, you know, what's that? and they have people who evaluate them all that will help you decide. So not, these people aren't selling you anything. They're making an independent decision to help you get the best plan. See, salesmen, you can't trust a salesman. I mean, sure, a lot of them are honest and all this stuff, but their motives are different. They have to sell. You know, and it, it's very difficult for them to be uh, objective, and so you, you can't put them in that position. You know, don't, don't bother. Find an independent source. So evaluate it first. You want to try salesman later? Yeah, but get an independent source, and that's what this is. So it's a place you call, every state's going to have them, independent uh, uh, source, evaluate all the plans, help you decide. So these are free experts. You know, just like there, there's free experts now to help you with your credit problems and free experts to help you start a business. See, and the government has a lot of neat stuff out there that isn't money. So watch this video. It'll show you more about it. And your name is? Muhammad Doctor. I'm the director of the Department of Health and uh, also member of the Exchange Board. I see. Well, he, we're here to talk about <laughs> how good this Exchange Board is going to be <laughs> to the average person out there. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't start to look <laughs> for a year and a half. <laughs> well, some things have already started, but, uh, really? but the whole thing will really It'll be there. Will, there. Will, will be there. What will be available? Any any kind of a help on the exchanges earlier before that, you know, January? 14th? I think right now there are some things that have gone into place yeah. already that are already implemented by the federal law. I so see. You know, nobody has to do anything. Right. You don't need an exchange to implement I those see. things. For example, if you have a child in, at home mm -hmm. uh, who is less than 26 years of age, I they could see. get on right. your insurance. Uh -huh. So if your insurance company said no, you just no, pick up the I phone see. and call the, the, the line, and that's they, uh -huh. they they have to provide that. I so see. <laughs> so that's already already in place. Uh -huh. Same is true of charging for preventive health services. Oh. For example, you know you go, you want to have a mammogram right. done, or you right. want to have cholesterol checked. There's no fee for it. There's oh, no co-payment. There's no deductible. Nothing. Every insurance. So even right now, right I mean, now, it's news for it's me. And right I'm now, in this it's, it's so right, right now, now right. when I feel, boy, you know, I, I want to get my cholesterol checked or anything, 
and my insurance says, no, that's not covered, they right. can't do that, even in existing policies. That's exactly right. Wow. Exactly right. So you go to wow. your doctor. How many people know that? So what, what, what people are missing in yeah. this, basically, right now wow. is that they're not going to the doctor and taking exactly. advantage of it. Exactly. Oh, definitely. Everybody should right. go to the doctors, and when the, they go to the doctor, the right. doctor will do the examination. Right. He will determine based upon your age right. and your sex what kind of test you need for preventive mm -hmm. services, whether you need cancer screening or whether you need cholesterol screening or whether you so need... So can you be that general in calling the doctor, hey, I, I just want to have... I, I, absolutely. I don't want to have a checkup. I want to be checked up. I want to be checked up. So you could call your doctor right now, and yeah. all the insurance p plans have to pay for it. Exactly. Right? What the hell? No, no question about that. I mean, that's the <laughs> right. that's the that's big fantastic. advantage of this thing. That's the big yeah, advantage. But I thought of that, that was yeah later. No, 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 no. Now. That's right now. Right, right now. now. Right now. I mean, today. I heard about the kids, but I heard about the no, right now. Wow. Right now, that you could just go down wow. and really get that. No, I can so take what would you? Through. What are the things that you would tell your your parents now to to think about? <laughs> if I tell, if I, my parents were living today, yeah. you know, I would just say, you know what, go and get yourself screened. I see. Yeah. And do it every year. Right. Go down and get, get yourself checked you. up. I would tell my parents all the vaccinations, mm. whether it's flu, I see. Right. whether it's for I pneumonia, yeah. it's free. Right. There's no co-payment. So they, they don't can't even co-pay you. No. Like you're None. right. I just had a physical myself like yeah. this past week, and I don't think I had a copay. Yet. And so you just, yeah. you just there's no copay. So you just yeah. go ahead and say, this is wow. what I, this is what I, 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 uh, I wow. need, based right. upon your, your, your age and right. your sex, and you know they just provide right. you all the screening. If they had taken care of themselves early on, right? And you know we wouldn't be in this bad right. situation after you know right. certain number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, my both parents had great medical mm -hmm. difficulties in their list of. You know, 15, 16 medication that you are right. always uh, <laughs> trying Boy, to work out. Boy, that's a cocktail every day. Yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. funny how we manage now. Right. Besides health, I mean, exercise every right. day because of that. But now I'm thinking, how do I exercise my mind? Yeah. So what I decided to do, I'm taking Chinese. But but when we, when <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the hardest thing I could do with my mind? <laughs> yeah, but many people just sort of think that preventive services mean going down there yeah. and getting your blood pressure checked, right. your cholesterol checked. It's more than that. It's, it's way more than that. Yeah. Preventive services also include that if you are smoking, mm. they provide you counseling. Oh, I see. It's paid for, wow. for quitting smoking. If you have substance alcohol problem, uh -huh. you oh. know, they help no you with that. Kidding. If you have weight problem, they wow. help counseling for that. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's really a very good deal <laughs> for the people. Yeah. Gosh, I didn't really think about that. Yeah. Know, mental... Physical and uh, God, smoking cessation. Yeah. That, that's terrific. And a lot of people just don't seek help because they don't yeah. know how much it's going to exactly. cost. The insurance company were not right, paying exactly. it in the past, right. and what might happen. And then they'll sue you. Yeah, yeah, and all right. of those things. But no, not yeah. anymore. Not anymore. We we just sort of but not anymore with we healthcare today. Yeah, right today. Today. Yeah. Today. Well, that's terrific. Well, yeah. you're awfully nice you're here. My pleasure. Thank now, listen, you. Listen, I've come find out about this health insurance stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like what, almost 20% of our listen, economy is Listen, it's up to you. Right? Yeah, now it's up <laughs> to you to go of. take advantage of it. Go get yourself <laughs> checked up. Get all your vaccines See, that you need, an need and make sure that you, have, um, <laughs> you are up to date on everything. <laughs> oh, thank Great. you. Thank you Great very guy. much. Okay, you see that guy? <laughs> he was a terrific fella. But, you see, I mean, Find out about the problem. The health, find out where that health exchange is going to be in your state. You know, I mean, this is important stuff. I mean, this is a game changer. You know, this is going to save your life, save you a lot of money <laughs> and everything. Health is, you know, what, what could be more important? You know, uh, so don't find out the baseball games first. Find out about that exchange, where it is, how you're going to use it, okay? And if you don't know how to do that, you know, call your elected official or that 211 is a good place, too. They'll be in every state eventually. And if your state doesn't have one, then there's a national one. So don't worry about it, okay? Your health is important. Boy, Matthew Lesko, he certainly is interesting. He certainly is fun, and I hope he's helping you get some free money. But we got to get out of here. We've certainly gone over our time with Kate Gessler and Matthew Lesko. I hope everybody has a great Memorial Day holiday. I hope you enjoy the tournament. I hope Mirfield is a success, and I hope it doesn't rain even though it's bound to. But for this episode of Scott Spears Now, this is Scott Spears heading for the dugout.